And good evening again to another uh, Mid Ulster Amateur Radio Club Tuesday night lecture. If you're joining us live, you're obviously more than welcome again. And also, if you're catching us on the YouTube, great to have you along there. Please do feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, this evening, we're uh, joined uh, by Bob, uh, who will give us a wee introduction in a, in a few minutes there. Um, but uh, before uh, you, uh, you, we go on to Bob there, just remind you that we're once every two weeks. So uh, we move to once every two weeks in, at the start of October there. We have November planned out and December is getting there. So good to have you along. But do look out for us on uh, the social media and everything else. So, uh, Bob, if, uh, if I can just get you to unmute there. Uh, maybe you want to start with a wee uh, hello. Uh, tell us a wee bit of an introduction uh, about yourself, your call sign, everything else, and uh, we'll go from there and hand it over to you then, Bob. Okay. Very good evening to everyone again. And uh, many thanks for inviting me along. If I can get my excuses in first, I'm a complete novice at Zoom. So if I make a bit of a mess of this, <laughs> you'll understand why. You're, you're among friends here, Bob. Don't you worry, you're oh, among yeah. friends. That's good. Okay, well, um, I'm now 5B4AGN, but uh, I started my amateur radio uh, in the UK <clears throat> 51 years ago. Um, well, longer than 51 years ago, but 51 years ago when I got uh, licensed. My UK call uh, is G3ZEM. But uh, we retired to Cyprus 21 years ago and I became 5B4AGN. Um, I think it's fair to say we enjoy the weather here a little bit more. Uh, I'm... Uh, I guess through, through my amateur radio career, I'm a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other. Um, I'm a bit of a contester. Uh, we've done quite a lot of contesting from here. Uh, I have a, a contest call, which uh, is now allocated to a club, which allows other people to use it along with me. And that's uh, P3F. Uh, although I've done quite a lot of contesting using 5B for AGN too. <clears throat> I'm also a bit of a DXer. Uh, I like chasing DX and uh, spend a lot of time on HF bands. Well, all, all of the HF bands and LF bands. A um, bit of a de-expeditioner too. I've done a number of de-expeditions, but if you're not a CW guy, uh, you probably wouldn't have noticed any of them because um, I'm almost 100% CW. I do a little bit of sideband and a little bit of data modes, but CW is really my thing. So when I've done the expeditions, they've been CW expeditions mostly. Uh, I'm also a, a CW rag chewer, so I do a bit of that too. And... Uh, I'm a constructor and experimenter, hence I guess my uh, interest in bandpass filters and, and other things. So that's a, a rough introduction. What, what I plan to do is to run through some slides with, uh, with PowerPoint. Um, I didn't really know what level to pitch this thing at, so it's a fairly gentle introduction to uh, filters and bandpass filters. Um, which will hopefully give you uh, give you some ideas if uh, if you've not already been involved in this or if you have yearning to maybe uh, brew your own, uh, I can give you a few pointers in terms of software that will help to support your efforts. So I'll I'll now switch to uh, share the screen if I can in a moment so that I can bring up uh, if I can just find it. OK, 
Okay, I, I share the screen now. I think I can then, <laughs> with a bit of uh, bit of effort here. Trying to find, all right, here we are. Okay. Do you, are you seeing what I'm seeing or not? Yeah, yeah, that's great. You're just you ready to start the show and then that'll be you. Okay, okay. So you've seen this, uh, I've just talked about what's on this slide anyway, so I'll move straight on to the next one. I can, maybe not. Where are we? All right, here we are. <clears throat> okay, filter basics. I'm sure you probably know all about this anyway, but uh, LC filters have basically two, two prime components, capacitors and inductors. And uh, the, the difference between these two things, again, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but uh, with a capacitor, its reactance reduces as the frequency increases, whereas with an inductor, the opposite happens. As the frequency increases, um, the reactance increases with it. And in LC circuits, whether they're series or parallel, resonance occurs when the capacitive reactance is equal to the inductive reactance. So that's basically LC filters 101, I guess. And here we have uh, the two typical parallel and series circuits for a capacitor and inductor. And in a parallel circuit, the impedance across it is very high at resonance where XC equals XL. Whereas with a series uh, resonance circuit, the impedance is very low at resonance. <clears throat> I just run through the four basic filter types, if I may. Low pass filter, where you can see looking at the, the graph here, uh, everything gets through at the low end of the graph, but then as we move up in frequency, the attenuation increases. And a low pass filter like this, you'll all be uh, to a degree familiar with. If anybody's got a, um, a valve radio or a valve amplifier still these days, then uh, a circuit such as this will exist on the output, a pi tank circuit. Very similar circuits exist in all solid state radios as well, but rather than being tunable as is a pi tank, uh, they are fixed, but broad banded. So that uh, typically these are used to make sure that the fundamental frequency that you're operating on gets to the antenna, whereas all of the harmonic frequencies don't. And that way, hopefully, keeps us out of trouble and stops us being on five bands at once. The high pass filter, you notice here, well, with the, the low pass filter, we had capacitors across inductors in series. Here we've got capacitor in series, inductors across. So going back to the reactance uh, guidance, Low frequencies will pass through the inductors to ground, but will find a very high, in, high uh, impedance ahead of it due to the relatively small value capacitor. But alternatively, the high frequencies will find the path through the capacitor quite easy, low reactance, but will find the path to ground very high reactance. So the high frequencies will pass through the filter. And again, the graph illustrates essentially what, uh, what happens here. 
We then have a, a band stop. I should have mentioned with the high pass, where, what typically might you use a high pass for? It can be a number of things, but stopping your HF um, transmitter getting into a television is a good use of a high pass filter. Although these days with uh, digital TV and the frequencies on which they operate, as well as all of the error recovery routines and all of that associated with it. Most of us don't need filtering on, uh, on TVs any longer, I suspect. But in the, in the old days of analog television and UHF, a high pass filter, usually a braid breaker was very common. So the band stop, <clears throat> again here with a band stop filter, we want low frequencies, to not get through the filter, uh, sorry, want low frequencies to get through the filter, but medium frequencies in the uh, stop band to be stopped by the filter. And likewise, we want frequencies above the stop band to get through. So we will use these typically, or as an example, if we were, if we built uh, a transceiver or a transmitter which had an IF of 10.7 megahertz, which is quite, quite common. But we also wanted to operate on 30 meters. So 10.1 to 10.15. They are very close. And so it would be quite difficult. And particularly, you know, you couldn't rely on your low pass filter output filters to make sure that the IF didn't appear at the output. So this is where you might use a band stop filter, something that's very narrow and specifically located on the IF frequency to allow you to operate and your 30 meter RF to get to the antenna without your IF getting through to the antenna at the same time. So that's a, a typical use of a band stop filter. <clears throat> then finally, we have the band pass filter. And the band pass filter, we want to stop RF below the pass band. We want to stop RF above the pass band and just allow those frequencies we're particularly interested in to pass through. And so this is really the, the subject uh, that we're talking about tonight. And uh, You, each, each of your transceivers will have some kind of uh, bandpass filters built in so that uh, typically you, you manage to receive uh, the band which you want to receive whilst blocking strong signals from outside of those bands. And amateur band transceivers would typically, or the higher end amateur band transceivers, would typically have uh, amateur band dedicated bandpass filters. Whereas the less expensive transceivers tend to have half octave filters, where a half octave filter uh, is enough, for example, to fit in 15 meters and 10 meters at the same time. Uh, that's not usually too much of a problem if you're uh, on your own without strong other signals around and about. But if you do have strong signals around and about, then a half octave filter can be a problem because it lets through two amateur bands at the same time. So amateur band, as I say, amateur band transceivers, the higher priced ones will tend to have these per band band pass filters. And they, they look after all day-to-day -day issues, most people wouldn't have difficulty with that until you get into a situation where you've got somebody sat next to you with an antenna pretty close that's operating on 20 meters whilst you're operating on 15 meters and somebody else on the other side of you is operating on 10 meters. <clears throat> then you're likely to have a problem. And you have a problem because of the strong fundamental energy that is induced in the antenna on which you are trying to receive. So you get blocking 
and you get all sorts of other effects happening which make listening very, very difficult. <clears throat> so the answer to, the, to this particular problem is to adopt some additional filters. And these, the easiest way of doing that, I mean, this could be done just with receive uh, filters, but they're quite difficult to implement because uh, you'd have to switch around them and so on when you're transmitting. So the, tip, the way typically of dealing with this is to build filters which are capable of handling your transceiver power so that your transmitted signal can pass through as well as your receive signal. This has an additional benefit, particularly if you're using some older synthesized rigs uh, or perhaps using some of the less expensive synthesized rigs because uh, in, that, in those cases, uh, you also potentially have another problem to deal with, which is wideband synthesizer noise. And this can be very wideband. You can find that um, somebody operating on 20 meters, for example, will have harmonics and synthesizer noise suppressed above 20 meters. So you probably won't hear on 15 or 10, but the synthesizer noise, if it is there, uh, will be audible on all of the lower frequencies because the output filtering is just low pass. Now this is, this is not something that happens, you, you wouldn't find this if you're using a high quality radio, you know, it's something like a, a K3 that's got per band filters or any of the other radios that have per band filters they all tend to have uh, pretty good synthesizers as well. But that's, that's one transmit benefit you get with this kind of uh, arrangement. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna close this presentation now and just uh, give you a view of Elsie. Um, that's not my wife, that's this uh, program, LC, as in LC, uh, which is, uh, in the edition I'm going to show you is a free program uh, written by a friend, good friend of mine, Jim Tong, uh, who makes his software um, in, if you like, a, a slightly limited form, uh, available free of charge to experimenters, which is very handy for us, be the free version of this software, and that he does produce other software as well, incidentally. It's well worth going to look up Tom software. Uh, he makes all sorts of software, uh, free versions of which are available for our use as experimenters. So I'll just give you uh, a quick look at LC. Some of you are probably familiar with it anyway, but for those that aren't, I think you might find it interesting. Just as a bit of background, I guess 50 or 60 years ago, Filter design, bandpass filter design, was a very complicated business. The business of uh, filter design is heavily mathematical. And uh, it's just as well we're not dealing 50 years ago because my mathematics is pretty well limited to arithmetic and a, a bit of geometry. But when you get into more heavy stuff, then I'd rather leave it to other people. Fortunately, these days, we don't need to worry about any significant mathematics. We can use these modeling packages, which are very, very good, very accurate. And it's a good price, free. So if you just give me a moment, I'll uh, see if I can juggle my way to bring up Elsie. Sorry. Get out of that. Okay. <clears throat> Hopefully you're seeing this as well. Is that right? No, we're, we're still on the uh, PowerPoint page there. So you may have to actually just okay. stop, stop share and then restart it. Okay. So you can, you can pick that window there. PowerPoint page. Okay, so I've stopped sharing that.
Okay. Great. Are we in business? Yep. All right. Well, this is the opening screen of, uh, of LC, and this uh, provides us with a very convenient ability to design LC filters or stub filters in many different configurations. So what, what I will do, I mean, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, those who are interested can find it, I think, easily enough. And you'll find that it's quite intuitive. There is also a very comprehensive manual available for free download if you go to tonsoftware.com. Um, so you'll be able to find out exactly what you need. But if I go into new design, oh. I'm not sure why it did that. But, uh, If I change the screen, it seems to uh, drop out. Anyway, are we? You've got this other screen now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. all good. <clears throat> well, just as an example, if you look at the left-hand side here, this gives you all kinds of topologies that you can use in terms of uh, capacitor input, low pass, inductor input, low pass, etc., etc., etc. I'm going to pick out here. A band pass, a shunt input band pass. So we'll pick that out. There are then different families of filters, and I won't go through all of these. They all have uh, different purposes, but one which is convenient for these transmit band pass filters is the Chebyshev. Chebyshev is better than Butterworth in that it provides for sharper roll-off. Um, it's also quite easy to align. Uh, so if we choose Chebyshev, then over here, we can define the, the characteristics of the filter that we want to build. So if we say, for example, we'd like a filter that is about a megahertz wide, so we put in there one M, that's for one megahertz. And we want it to have a center frequency of 14 megahertz. At this stage, you, it'll be a three pole filter, but you can actually design it with up to seven poles. If you pay for the licensed version of the software, I think you can go up to something like 11 or 15 poles or something like that, but that's unlikely to be necessary for our purposes. So the next thing we have to tell the program is the impedance of the filter, so 50 ohms, and how much passband ripple we're prepared to tolerate. So if I put in 0.1 dBs, then we can move over here, it'll probably lose me again and I'll need to bring it back, but we can go to plot. It has, it's lost me again, so. It doesn't like it when I change screens. So here is, um, here is the shape of the filter. Uh, centered, you, you can put left finger down on the mouse and if you can see at the bottom here, it'll tell you where you are in terms of frequency. So from roughly 13.5 megahertz with a loss of 1.3 dBs at that point. Get up here. And that will run to about 14.5. So that's the one megahertz bandwidth. And we see it's got a, a roll off. So typically, uh, here, if we if we were operating on seven megahertz, that would be giving us a seventy five dB attenuation, somewhat less at twenty one. It's about, but still about sixty dBs. So very significant attenuation. That would be a useful bandpass filter. 
you can, having done that, you can return to the design. If you, if you need steeper skirts, you can return to the design. You could say, I'll, I'll bring it back in a moment. <clears throat> return to the design and you could increase the order. So maybe make it a fifth order filter. We'll lose it again when I go to plot it. And you can see what's happened. So by putting in more poles, we've made the filter much sharper. But we've, what we've also done is increased the loss through the filter. So now instead of around 0.7 or whatever it was of a dB, this filter now has at 14 megs, almost two dBs loss, uh, which you wouldn't particularly want if you're putting power into these things. So again, a, a three dB, sorry, a third order filter with the loss that that will provide. And the losses incidentally are reactive losses. These aren't um, resistive losses. So whilst you may end up with less power coming out, you are not uh, burning the filter up by uh, dumping the power that's disappeared into it. They are just uh, reactive losses. Now there are some uh, resistive losses as well, of course. And for this, to avoid the resistive losses, you would build transmitting filters with good quality components. So uh, capacitors, for example, you want to make sure these have uh, very low uh, series resistance. All capacitors have a series resistance. Uh, you want to make sure for transmitting purposes, it's as low as possible. So uh, typically this would mean uh, either using very small uh, unleaded ceramics or using micas which have um, very low or guaranteed zero um, iron in them. Mica capacitors, the, the little red mica capacitors that you see are very common uh, if you do any kind of construction using that sort of thing. Uh, they tend to be uh, capacitors that have quite a lot of iron in them. And so the Q of those capacitors is lower. Now, to get good, good quality, uh, good performance filters, high Q components are what you need, where Q uh, is effectively the reactance of the capacitor divided by the resistance of the capacitor. And likewise with a, an inductor, it's the reactance of an inductor divided by the resistance of the inductor. And so the higher the Q, the lower the losses. So uh, with this, having designed the filter, if that's the shape you want, it probably wouldn't be for a transmit bandpass filter. You'd have been happy with the three, three pole you could then go and look at the schematic, which it'll drop out again. And here's the schematic for a fifth order bandpass filter, which tells you all of the component values. Some of them are very uh, obtuse looking values, of course, uh, because this has been uh, optimized without any care for preferred values and so on. But you can, you can then, if you wish, you can uh, play around and change the values of these capacitors. You can go into uh, the edit routine. And in the edit routine here, 
you could see what the effect, for example, of saying, well, you know, I can't get a 3,650.42 picofarad capacitor, <clears throat> but I can get 3,600, even if I've got to make that with a 2,000 and a 1,600. So you can change that, edit the values in this stage. So you change that to 3,600, tell it you accepted it. We then have to go to plot again, which will kick me off. But... And you can see that's made not too dramatic a difference to it. So you'd get away with that one. Now you can also, you can also do different kinds of uh, tuning. You can go into tune apart and that will allow you to change through multiple uh, values, individual parts, or multiple parts. There are other facilities like Monte Carlo, which will actually run a routine changing values. And you can pick which of the shapes it has produced that you consider optimum and look back at the values uh, for that. So the, the program has a lot of capability in it. And uh, even for, for interest, even if you're not actually planning to build filters, it's, it's a very useful pro program to, uh, to play with. Far, far easier than uh, designing filters from scratch. Okay, I'll go back uh, to the presentation in a moment. I need to just uh, restart. Okay. We should be back where I uh, left off in the presentation now, hopefully. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the, uh, this is the program that I use and I, I certainly recommend it to you if you're thinking about any kind of filter design. Okay, so looking at uh, external bandpass filters, where do we need them? Well, I think uh, probably, probably some of you have found this out for yourself. Multiple stations in close proximity are the, uh, the issue. And this, this situation arises with contesting in the expeditions where they want to be active on multiple bands at the same time with multiple operators. And likewise, it can happen if you have a large scale exhibition, which has multiple stations at the same time, all in close proximity. <clears throat> I'll just mention as a by the by, at my own station, I use uh, on one tower, I have a Force 12 C31XR. Now that is a, um, is three monoband Yagis on a single boom. So it has three full size elements on 20 meters, four full size elements on 15 and seven full size elements on 10. And this kind of antenna can either be fed with a single feeder or it can be fed with three separate feeders. So in my case, I have three separate feeders. The driven elements, the three dipoles, exist within 30 centimeters of each other. So they're spaced by about 30 centimeters. They are in the same plane. So they're parallel to each other on, the, on a common boom. So it's pretty hard to get antennas much closer together than that. These things are very close together. And so bandpass filters and other measures were necessary here to be able to cope with that. So 
back to why we need them. We, we need these filters to protect our receivers. The bandpass filters we've got built into our transceivers, uh, if you accidentally cross couple a hundred, you know, a hundred watts into them, which is very easy to do if you're running uh, high power in contests, we're, we're allowed 1500 watts here. Um, so cross coupling a hundred watts is very easy to do. And frankly, you'll melt your filters inside the uh, transceiver and damage all sorts of other things, pin diodes and so on. It's a bit of a mess to fix. So you really want to avoid doing that. And of course you want it to stop crossband interference. Out, out, outside of the band, signals are heavily attenuated by these external bandpass filters. So you don't get blocking and other things which otherwise you might do, even if you're not busy melting your own front end. As far as transmit is concerned, these transmitting filters are essentially transparent. They have slight loss, but nothing, nothing too significant. So they look like an open window as far as the band on which you are operating is concerned. I mentioned earlier, if you have broadband TX noise, the filters will stop that being propagated and making problems on other stations as well. <clears throat> All of this stuff uh, encouraged me to uh, build some bandpass filters. And this was uh, actually in 2007, 2008, because in the three years prior to that, when we were doing uh, multi-single and multi-two contesting operations from here with commercial filters, uh, we had a lot of failures. We had uh, filter capacitors blown this is, uh, you know, if you inadvertently select the wrong filter and stick 100 watts through it, you can uh, destroy the filter. Likewise, if you have high power stations transmitting, so say you're sitting there on the 20 meter band and you have a high power station running on the 15 meter band and you want to switch from 20 to 10, Problems can happen, and with, uh, with some of these uh, commercial filters we had, we found that when we were doing that, um, the RF coupled from the 15 meter station, for example, that was on transmit, while we were switching, was enough to weld together the contacts of the relays. So over three years, we didn't have a single year in which we didn't have a bandpass filter failure. <clears throat> and we got to the point, I mean, we, we went the route of trying different filters. We went the route of having spare filters, but you know, uh, one blown filter in a six band unit, you can only fix it by taking the whole thing out of service. So uh, it wasn't very effective. We, we struggled through that and in the end decided we had to do something and, uh, the answer was going to be to build our own. So we came up with uh, a list of criteria. We wanted it to be close to bomb proof. We didn't want to be blowing these things up in the middle of a contest because it certainly upsets your runs if your filter goes poof. Um, we looked at the things which were causing most of the problems capacitors failing notably and select relays failing. So we took steps to increase the, the quality and rating of both of those components. So we sourced some custom mica capacitors which are very low iron, very low FE, and some heavier duty filter select relays. Uh, we decided to go to a, a mother and daughter board approach so that there was an individual filter for each of the six bands. So if one filter happened to break, 
uh, we could remove it and we could leave the overall filter unit still in operation and good on the other five bands. We didn't have to take the whole thing out. We made them plug compatible with June Star 600s, which were the, the ones that we'd uh, had quite a lot of trouble with. And then a little bit later, we decided that it would be a good idea if we integrated a, a manual select filter switch and some indicator LEDs on the front, which the June Star 600s don't have, uh, and then uh, integrated a BCD band decoder and antenna relay driver. So it, it got rid of having to the need to have separate band decoders and separate units to, to drive antenna relays. <clears throat> And this is, this is what resulted. This is the uh, multi-band bandpass filter that uh, I designed and uh, we built. Uh, initially when I designed this, I was just going to have, uh, I wasn't gonna have a motherboard, I was going to use a coax harness to tie the whole thing together. But uh, I spoke to various UK guys, uh, contesters, and asked if they were interested as well, because it seemed to me, if we got a few people interested, we could, uh, we could make it a motherboard and daughterboard arrangement and run strip lines around the motherboard to avoid all of the coaxial harnessing and the uh, awkward wiring. And uh, quite a lot of uh, contesters uh, came on board with that. And so that's exactly what we did. And this is what we ended up with. So you can see here, the six filters. At the left here is the, uh, the control switch for manual operation with the LEDs, which you can't really see, but you can see a bit of red down through the gap. with six LEDs down at the front. This module here is a plug-in band decoder and the, the driver for external antenna relays. So this is driven typically, you know, with Yesu band data or Ellicraft band data, uh, or can alternatively be driven with band line information, just a single band line per band uh, through uh, a separate socket. May I ask a question in between, Bob? Say again? May I ask a question in between? Yes, go ahead. Uh, the two relays to the right, is uh, this a pass through? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sim simply a band pass, so that if, if you have a rig that, for example, is also operating on the, uh, the walk bands outside of contests, mm -hmm. you wouldn't need to reconfigure the station. I when see. you select the walk band, it goes straight through. Okay, thank you. The, this business down here, these links, uh, these provide for either walk bands either going straight through or an open circuit if a non-contest band is chosen. And so if you're actually using it for contesting and your rig could accidentally be switched to a walk band, you'd want to configure this uh, with the, these links so that you got a, an open circuit on a walk band. Otherwise, you'd be liable to damage your transceiver. Um, you can see here, I mean, this is a bit of a strip line running between the, the two bypass relays. And then a strip line runs along the bottom here and along the top. These blue capacitors are the uh, high quality, high Q custom manufactured capacitors. If you look at these filters at the end, these are, have actually, uh, I have replaced these capacitors one or two people who've built these, a lot of people have built them now, one or two people who've built them have found in certain situations that capacitors in 15 megahertz, sorry, in 15 meter band filters and 10 meter band filters can fail. They've tended to fail, I think, when they've been inadvertently driven into a short circuit, a faulty uh, coax plug or something like that, or when wire antennas have managed to touch each other. 
the the values of the series capacitors which these are replacing on the very high the, the 15 meter and 10 meter filters are low value in the 15 meter filter it's 14 picofarads and the 10 meter filter just 12 picofarads and one of the issue with these micas is that current handling um, capability reduces with reducing value and that's fairly easy to understand really because as the capacitor value reduces the plate area inside the capacitors reduces and so the current has got to be handled by a smaller amount of metal flashing on the mica and so it is this this lower current handling uh, that makes these things more more liable to fail so it has to be said the number of failures we've seen here have been few um, i i've not experienced any failures at all over 12 years but this prompted me to go to this kind of arrangement and what 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 i have here is some very very high voltage PTFE semi-hardline coaxial. It's quite convenient really because its capacitance is uh, very close to one picofarad per centimeter. So cutting the stuff to length to make 12 picofarad and 14 picofarad capacitors is quite uh, quite easy and it uh, it rolls up quite nicely and fits fits in in that slot. I've actually tested these things. I mean, I wouldn't encourage people to, uh, to run them as such because these filters are rated at 200 watts, but I've tested these uh, at 500 watts, these filters that have the PTFE homemade capacitors, and they survive perfectly well, although I didn't margin that at high SWR. I, I ran that into... Uh, into a sensible SWR, which I think was about 1.3 to 1. So um, this kind of uh, filter arrangement you would want to use if you were doing SO2R, for example, Sing single operator, two radios. Um, I don't know if any of you have tried this stuff, but <clears throat> when you're using single operator, two radios, it's advisable to try and make your setup uh, as clean and convenient as possible. Ideally, if you're using two radios, both radios will be the same. Ideally, if you're switching from 20 meters to 10 meters, all you have to do is to change band on the transceiver. Everything else, the bandpass filters, the antenna switching, everything is done automatically so that uh, you can hop from one band to another without messing around, changing, plugging things in or anything like that. No manual tuning, it just looks after it all. You also want it so that if you've got two radios and one's on 15 and the other's on 20, and the one that's on 20, you accidentally try to make it go to 15, you want it such that it doesn't get there. It may switch to 15 meters, but it certainly isn't going to go anywhere near connecting the antenna um, because obviously that would uh, be damaging. So it needs to be, everything needs to be fail safe, particularly if it's a 48 hour contest and it's, you know, the 37th hour and beyond where your ability to reason is significantly impacted. Uh, you want things to just work. You don't want to have to think about how you make it work. Uh, so you would use this kind of auto-switched filter arrangement with auto-switched antennas connected to it, if you're doing that. Or, for example, if you're, if you're doing a multi-single or a multi-two type contest operation where each station maybe needs to access a number of bands so that uh, 
you only have two stations or maybe three stations, but of course you've got six bands, so you need to be able to switch around. This kind of filter is useful for that. Again, to fully automate, to protect against two stations on the same band and to get you from one band to another without anything, uh, any complicated requirement to think. So that's, that's that. <clears throat> this is the other implementation of these filters. Very simple and very similar. Uh, slightly different printed circuit board, uh, but these filters are individual standalone filters. So these would be very useful, for example, in a multi-multi contest station or on a de-expedition where maybe if you're on a de-expedition with a bunch of guys and you've got four stations, using filters like this is a far better bet. It's a better bet because you can only, you can only operate on the band that you have the filter for. And this, it makes it, these are cheaper to produce, of course. You don't have all of the switching relays. You, you're not replicating multiple, multi-band filters between stations. You just need the one of these for the band that you're on. So on a de-expedition, for example, if you've got your four stations and six bands or whatever, uh, it, it may be on a de-expedition you'd have 11 bands, of course. You may be doing all of the walk bands plus 60 and uh, six meters. Uh, so you'd have filters for each. And the benefit is that effectively the filter becomes the key to the band. If you don't have the filter, you can't go on that band. So if somebody wants to change bands, they have to look at the filters that are available and they can go on the bands that are not currently in use by one of the other operators. So that makes a de-expedition or a multi-multi um, station fail safe if you just play by those simple, simple rules. In terms of design, these filters are exactly the same. It's just that uh, the PCB is different uh, so that it fits into this enclosure. <clears throat> just a word on alignment. Uh, this is a, uh, a shot of a corner of, uh, of my workshop. I'm quite fortunate here. My shack is in the house, although I'm uh, I'm using my wife's computer at the moment because she has the camera. Um, but my shack, my shack is located next to the kitchen. Where else? Um, my workshop is in, uh, is underneath our garage block. I had a, when we built that, I got them to excavate a big, a big hole in the ground and we built the garage block with a, a cellar, which houses my workshop. This is just a, a corner of it. And uh, if I can show you here, uh, this unit here is uh, a vector network analyzer. It's uh, a home-built VNA. We thought on the front of it, this is the a bridge. And this analyzer has uh, two inputs, one of them through the bridge here, and one of them direct here. So this, this provides for being able to look at the signal passing through a filter and also the return loss in the filter and to look at those things at the same time. Uh, this little bit of PCB here with switches and lights on it is just my uh, makeshift band data producer. So I can plug it in and make sure that the uh, band data decoder and antenna relay driver is working properly. If the band data decoder is working properly by these switches, I will get it to switch band to band. And if the antenna relay driver is working properly, it'll light up the associated light on here. So I don't need to connect a rig when I'm testing these things. And so that's the an N2PK VNA was uh, Paul 
uh, Kichak, which is who is a good uh, good friend of mine, designed this thing some years ago, and so uh, I built to his design. And uh, it's driven by software produced by G8KBB, a program called MyVNA, which is a very uh, a very impressive program, and uh, provides the ability to. Uh, adjust filters of all kinds of types um, very, very easily. And I'll give you a, a bit of a, <clears throat> a look at that. You can see on here, I actually Im imported it here as a, uh, as a video, but I think you'll see it better if I close this presentation now and open the video itself, which I'll, I'll do. Uh, to see where we are. Okay. Just give me a moment. Struggling to find it here. No. Nope. Sorry about that. I don't seem to be able to, I can't see it in the list of screens that I can show you. So I'll have to just do it on the, uh, on here, which is where we were. Apologies. No problem at all. Right, are you back at this screen with the Yep, yep, we are indeed. Okay. <clears throat> so what, what this is looking at here, this is the 160 meter band filter in that multiband unit. This top trace, this shows you the half band shape and the top two Markers here show are uh, here. It's 1.78 megahertz and 1.99 megahertz, and it shows you that you have there is an insertion loss of a little bit less than 0 0.3 of a dB. This beneath it here um, is return loss. So return loss is just a different way of describing SWR. So it's better to look at return loss because you get a bigger change for a small adjustment than you do if you're looking at SWR. So for adjustment purposes, return loss is a lot better. And if we look over here, this is return loss zero through to 40 decibels. And a good measure is 20 dBs of return loss. If you get 20 dBs of return loss, that's roughly a 1.2 to 1 SWR. So if you have filters with a 1.2 to 1 SWR, it's not gonna cause any fold back or anything like that in your transceiver. Um, so the power that comes out of the transceiver goes straight through. And 20 dBs, I mean, most, mostly, the, these things were just quickly adjusted. It is possible to get significantly more than 20 dBs but it's a question of diminishing returns. You know, if you want to do it as an exercise, I mean, I, I've been able to get all of these filters up to 30 dBs, but it's sort of, it's a bit of an academic exercise. You know, you move your SWR 
into the filters down from about 1.2 to about 1.15. So a big deal. You know, the, the effect that that has on uh, your transmitter output is approximately nothing. So it's just an academic exercise. But 20 dBs is a useful, a useful figure and quite easy to adjust to get to. So if I go down here, I can start this thing running. This shows you what happens. <clears throat> this, uh, the VNA scans quite quickly. It depends on what um, dynamic range you want. You can get up to about 120 or almost 130 dBs of dynamic range. But if you want to do that, it's very slow. So it's not very good for dynamic adjustment. This is just switched to the 80 meter filter here. Um, the dynamic range is reduced. It's actually down, it's, it's about 100 dBs, but 0 to 80 works well for our purposes with these filters. And as you can see, it scans pretty quickly. So if you're adjusting the filters while this thing is scanning, you can see real time the effect of your adjustments. It makes alignment quite easy. This is now on to the, uh, this is the 20 meter filter. It obviously went through 40 whilst I was talking. You can see on here we're almost, you know, these are up above 30, 25 and 30 dBs return loss. And the band is actually in the, in the center of something that is quite, quite wide. Equally so on 15. Down here, these figures are telling us the, you know, the insertion loss is about 0 0.6 of a dB. It increases as you go up in frequency, the insertion loss increases. And when we get to 10 meters, which it should do in a moment, again, it's a 25 dB return loss, but the insertion loss is now about 0 0.7 of a dB, I believe. Uh, well, no, it's actually, it's not point, it's still not point 0.6. <clears throat> In tuning these filters, because the, the capacitors are fixed, the way these filters are tuned is just by squashing turns together on the toroids or spreading them further around the core. That's the, adjusting the inductance is the, the way to tune them. So there we are. I hope that uh, some of that at least has been of some use, some interest. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to try and answer them. I should probably get rid of this now, should I? Fantastic, uh, Bob, you know, some really great information in there. And yes, absolutely. If anyone does have any questions, now is your time, feel free. I'm sure there's some people there have some wonderful comments as well so uh folks one at a time go ahead if anyone's any questions for for bob there no one so i'm gonna start thanks very much bob for the nice lectures it was quite interesting and uh i think it uh, uh might be of use for me too because uh sometimes i'm also a keen shortwave listener uh, trying to uh, uh do some um, a broadcast DX and uh, filtering out a stronger radio stations might be uh, um, of interest to me too. Thanks. Okay. So is that stations that are very close to each other or? Um, sometimes yes. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, for example, uh, str stronger uh, AM stations and the medium wave band, um, which uh, might have an impact on uh, a sensitive uh, first IF stage of uh, different receivers. All right. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, certainly uh, this kind of filter would be very effective in that situation. In some cases, uh, you know, people are located to uh, close to uh, medium wave transmitters. And if you have one of those locally, you can have terrible problems, particularly on, on the low bands, for example. 
So, you know, a filter that would, uh, well, a number of ways of doing that. You know, if they're all medium wave stations you want to get rid of, you can get rid of the medium wave um, by using a high pass filter. Uh, that, that's true, but I think bandpass filter, filtering is more interesting to me. Thank you. Okay. I think I might have sent one or two to sleep here. <laughs> and so I just want to ask, um, what is your temperature there at the moment? Sorry again? What, what, um, what temperature is it in Cyprus at the minute? Oh, we're two hours ahead of you. Yeah, but uh, how warm is it? How? Warm. Oh, how warm, the temperature. Yeah. Well, today, today was 30 degrees. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty warm, really, for the end of October, even here. Right. Uh, but I, I think over the next few days, we expect it to drop back to about 26 or 27. Mm -hmm. Oh, is is that all, Bob? Oh dear, twenty six oh, degrees. Terrible. It's tough, you know. I mean, we put our overcoats on in this weather. <laughs> nice one, thank you. It's only six degrees here. Oh dear. <laughs> well, in is, is there a, is there a straight out of the box band filter that will work on all occasions, or is it is it a you have so many variables that um, you really do have to sort of take everything into account. Um, well, there are straight out of the box bandpass filters that are good for contesting. Um, there, there are a number of those. I mean, back back in two thousand and eight when I was prompted to design our own, the, the ones that were available were a bit limited. But there are some very good filters available now from a number of manufacturers, I think. Uh, but also, you know, there's the homebrew version, uh, as I showed you. Um, you know, I have uh, a lot of people have built filters exactly like the one I showed you from kits of parts and PCBs and so on. And so for contesting, yeah, there are filters available for, for uh, de-expeditioning. Uh, there are designs available anyway and bits and pieces available for people if they want to build them. Likewise, there are complete ones available to buy. But it, it's hard for me to say that they will meet every purpose. And indeed, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, here with my station where it's set up for contesting using uh, three Yagis on a common boom with the driven elements only 30 centimeters apart. Um, yes, we need the bandpass filters uh, that I've shown you, uh, but we also need some other filtering uh, because these bandpass filters will uh, filter out a reasonable amount of power, four or five, you know, five, maybe even 10 watts of wrong band RF is going to be filtered away quite adequately, but probably not 150 watts. And if you look at uh, my uh, C31XR, uh, I did uh, a basic RF audit. It's very difficult to, um, and quite complex to do a fully comprehensive RF audit because impedances change depending upon, you know, the impedance of a 15 meter Yagi when you're looking at uh, 20 meter RF is anything but 50 ohms or 75 ohms. It's something completely different. But I came up with a, a basic metric for being able to assess uh, how much wrong band RF might end up hitting these filters and whether it would be harmful to the filters. And uh, what I did, I would put the maximum amount of RF that I would be likely to use. So here, as I say, we can use 1500 watts in contests. So I would put 1500 watts into my C31XR on 15 meters, for example. 
And then on the 20 meter uh, Yagi on the same boom, I would terminate that through a reverse connected power meter into a 50 ohm load. And I would look at how much power from my 1500 watts on 15 meters, I would dump into a 50 ohm load at the end of the 20 meter coax. And I would do the same for 10 meters. And then I would do the same transmitting on 10 and looking at 15 and 20 and transmitting on 20 and looking at 15 and 10. And that gave me a matrix of powers dumped to a dummy load and allowed me to roughly scope the problem that that might cause. As I say, it's not technically, if you look at it clinically, it doesn't really stand up because the impedances are all over the place. But, you know, what we need as radio amateurs in situations like that is not something that's going to require us to have uh, £50,000 worth of test equipment to be able to dot the I's and cross the T's. We want a basic metric that's going to give us a clue about whether we're going to set fire to our transceiver or not. And so <clears throat> that's, that's what I did. And my, what I came up with was as long as I could get the amount of RF dumped into a dummy load on the unused Yagis, when I was putting full power into one of them, to five watts or below, then I would make, I would be confident that I would have no interference. Not only would it be safe, but I would have no interference between stations. And so with the C31XR, I started off with a bit of a problem because between, I think it's the 15 meter and 20 meter Yagi, if you put 1500 watts into, or whatever power you put into 15, uh, 15 meter Yagi, you can sink power, the same power minus 11 dBs into the dummy load. So from that 1500 watts, approximately 120 watts go into the dummy load. That is more of wrong, more wrong band RF than these filters are built to cope with. So the answer to that problem is on the output of the amplifiers to also use stub filters. And the stub filters, coaxial stubs, bring the amount of power down to around five watts or a bit below. And then the whole thing works. So it's, um, it's, in some cases, you can get away with just the passband filters. In some cases, you need more aggressive filtering. The example I've given, you can't really have something much more aggressive than putting your driven elements parallel to each other and 30, 30 centimeters apart. So uh, for example, <clears throat> in a typical de-expedition station, you wouldn't be using that kind of antenna. You'd probably be using monobanders, reasonably spaced, frequently uh, side on to each other. And so the RF that you're actually going to get cross-coupled is much less than 120 watts. And you'd probably be within the safe area of five watts or less without using bandpass filters. So it's for, you know, for, you need to do uh, an audit depending upon the, the setup that you have. Great stuff. Great stuff. Anyone else? Any questions there or comments? Yeah. yeah. Yes, if I may. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Thank, thanks, thanks for um, uh, a really uh, interesting um, presentation. Um, do you have to sequence, uh, use a sequencer for the filters, um, as in so that there's a little bit of a delay uh, before the power comes up or goes down um, for the RF power going up and coming down. Preamps. He's thinking of RF preamps. No, you, I mean, you don't need that with these. Um, you, you're never going to change band. The filter changes band to follow your transceiver. So you're never going to change band on your transceiver if you're transmitting. 
you know, you're, you're always listening when you, well, I mean, most transceivers, if you try to change band whilst you're transmitting on that transceiver, it wouldn't let you do it. Uh, it's locked out. You can only change band when you're receiving. And so whenever you change bands, there's no, no RF involved going through and it just switches across. Right. Thereafter. Okay. okay. I, was, I was thinking like, uh, we, we, we do on VHF and UHF if we're using high power and et cetera. Um, you know, so you don't blow up, blow up PA, uh, preamps or front ends and things. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't apply on, on this particular okay. version. Th thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Oh, I have uh, a question. question. Sorry. Okay, sorry. For, uh, right. I seen Paul. Paul's got a question, and then Terry had his hat up, and then we'll go to Peter his, his hand up. So that, that's a cue we'll go in. Paul, if you want to go M I zero A Y R, and then Terry, you take it straight up, and then over to Peter, please. Uh, Bob, you've got a pile up going here. Okay, uh, Bob, look, I appreciate the, the the presentation. Thank you very much for that. I have a wee question. You mentioned at the very very start that there was a, a little mod you did, I think, on the fifteen meter uh, module. Um, capacitor mod um, yep. I, bought, I bought a set of boards uh, years and years ago and I wonder has there been any artwork changes no no there's there's been no, no changes so my boards are uh, uh, valid and, and up to date as as a oh, uh, how, how long ago did you buy them oh my goodness uh, it's probably five or six years now no there's been not really any change in the last five or six years that I can recall okay so you be fine. The very very early boards, um, there was a change in the layout of the the filter boards themselves. But I mean, I'm I'm talking about 2009 or 2010. That would have happened. Sure, sure. And one one final question. Then you, you've you've sort of uh, inspired me to to resurrect these boards again. Um, at the time, I had. A wee bit of difficulty in, in terms of the tuning. Is, is it still preferable? I know you showed a VNA type setup there. Is is that the the way you would recommend to to get the yes. the, the filters tuned? Yeah, it is. And these days, I mean, you you can get these. Uh, are they called micro VNAs? Uh, the mini VNA or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the, no, 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 available for about fifty quid or something. I think, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. That's grand. Okay. And, and I know um, several people who they, they do take a bit of learning those things, uh, I gather, uh, because yeah. they can only do so many steps. So you need to use some additional software that allows you to do multiple, multiple cycles with the set, this limited number of steps to give you enough yeah. detail. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, there are, there are people um, on the group, group.io. Uh, TXBF, uh, TXBPF group that have done it. So there's plenty of uh, plenty of advice available, but they they've apparently done it and it's worked very well. Sure, sure. I'll resurrect it and give it another go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Terry G3PFC. Good evening, Bob. And uh... good evening, Terry. Sorry, oh, you've gone Ter past. Terry, you've went to mute again there. I wonder why. Okay, right, here we go. Um, yeah, thanks for the uh, lecture tonight, Bob, and thanks for selling me all the uh, bits and bobs that I needed to build a set of uh, single band filters. God, I talk about sore fingers and frustration. But anyway, it's mostly working. Um, I'm trying to get a reasonable shape for the return loss and a reasonable figure for the return loss. Mm -hmm. um, 20 dBs sometimes is achievable. I'm talking now about uh, uh, 24 megs. Uh, I've got 20 dB and a bit more on the lower bands. But uh, the shape of the return loss is um, not pretty. If I may, I'll share a screen. Okay. Uh, which is that one. And you can see 12 dBs at the points of interest. You can get it much more than that, but not 20 and not very symmetrical. It's very hard, I'm finding. A dB of insertion loss on 24 megs. 
Well, um, I've tried hard. I've got the um, each resonator. Let me stop the sharing. I've got each resonator spot on frequency mm -hmm. by lightly coupling uh, a loop and uh, uh, looking at resonance. And when I put it all together, still on frequency, um, I don't get what I regard as a reasonable shape that you described. Uh, although I noticed on your actual um, uh, presentation, uh, the shape wasn't very good. Um, but you've certainly got more dB's return loss. And I'm puzzled. And let me just ask the question and admit, uh, how critical is the winding wire gauge? Uh, I've used what I could. It's close, but it's not exact. Uh, it's not critical at all. That's what I was hoping you'd say, and that's what I thought. Yeah. So, uh, my question is, why only 15 dB? Well, oh. one thing that you need to think about, Terry, is there are two things going on when you adjust those um, coils. Yep. I mean, these, the filters that Terry is dealing with are more difficult because these are um, 11 band series filters, so they are inherently narrower. The filters which I showed you a little bit earlier are contest filters. And so the contest filters are fairly wide because there is, with the exception of 15 meters, there is a whole octave between bands. Between 20 and 15 and 15 and 10, it's a half octave. But when you insert the walk bands in between those, you've then only got a quarter of an octave distance between the filters. And so you need to have filter bandwidth reduced dramatically, otherwise the filters will not work. For example, if we used the contesting 10 meter filter in a station where there was 12 meter activity, that contesting 10 meter filter would only provide rejection of something like I think I'm, I'm trying to remember now, I bet it, was, it would be no more than seven or eight dBs at best, which is clearly not enough. So when you have walk bands involved, you have different filter designs. So and the ones that Terry is working on are this 11 band series. And for 12 and 10 megahertz, it, isn't, it is no longer possible to use toroidal cores because you, there are no toroidal cores available which will allow you to have a low enough inductance. So we revert in those filters to straightforward linear coils. So the two things that are going on, Terry, just to come back to yep. what I was going to draw your attention to, you have the overall inductance and you have the ratio of inductance of the uh, input to the output. The input to the, when I say the output, I don't mean the output, I mean the input to the um, LC circuit. So it's not just, it's not merely a case of stretching and compressing you can also adjust the difference in spacing of the single turn, which is the, uh, the point at which the input is fed, versus the other turns. And I think maybe if you play around in that area, you'll be able to get uh, a better result. But these things, you know, those particular filters are quite fickle when it comes to setup because they are so narrow and because it's, uh, you know, we have to do them just with linear coils on the input and output. Okay, so what you're saying is on the first resonator, L1 and C1 as it happens, uh, I need to stretch the right end rather than just the overall length. Both. You, you'll need to play around. So, you know, the, not, not, not only are you changing the overall, if you, if you squash it or stretch it, you're changing the resonant frequency of the circuit. Yeah. But, but I can squash the end and open the other end. 
uh, and make the resonant frequency the same, but the matching uh, will change. That's right. Okay, thank you. And of course, if, you know, if, if it is adjusted such that the impedance is affected, then the impedance not being 50 ohms will affect the return loss that you yeah. see. And indeed, the impedance is somewhere between 30 and 40 ohms only. And uh, right, now you point me how to, um, how to change that. And I'm grateful. Thank you. Okay. It's Peter, still go ahead. Yes, I was miles away. I was thinking about winding coils and um, stretching them and squeezing them. And, um, my question is, I, I'm not uh, sure I understood correctly about where the uh, coaxial stubs were to be inserted in your last uh, uh, example. Okay. Uh, well, after your amplifier. So they're between the um, transmitting amplifier and the antenna that it is feeding. Yes. Now there are there are uh, many discussions if you look on the web on where exactly you should put them after the amplifier. Uh, fortunately, it's quite quite convenient. Um, I ignored all the advice to have them a specific wavelength or proportion of a wavelength beyond the amplifier uh, because it was inconvenient for me to do so. Uh, but I got adequate attenuation. Essentially, what, what I do in my setup, I've got uh, two, uh, two by six switches and a, uh, a central box which cross connects the two two by six switches so that it gives me four stations. And all four stations have access to all antennas. <clears throat> so what I, what I do is uh, I have T pieces on the, uh, not, on, on, not on the two by six switches, but on the arbitration box between those two by sixes, I have T pieces and connect the stubs there. So they, ha they happen to be probably, um, I would guess, two, me two meters away from the output of the amplifier. But of course, two meters means different things on each different band. In terms of wavelength, it doesn't seem to matter because in every case, a single stub uh, reduces the cross-coupled RF to less than five watts. So the, the, the positioning I have not found to be that critical. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Bob. Uh, George, GI4SJQ here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation this evening. It's been fascinating to see the design and the the, the theory that goes into the design of the filters. Um, I'm a few stages behind Terry here in that I have the boards and uh, the toroids, uh, so, but no capacitors yet, and um, to build the individual uh, filters. So I was wondering a couple of questions. The first one was, uh, and the, the name of the uh, the company in England that supplies them is blanking me, but will they uh, supply them to small order or is there minimum order quantities? Well, regrettably, they have uh, in recent times become quite difficult. Um, when I first started uh, using these capacitors, it was a different company that manufactured them, but the, the company you're thinking of is Charcroft Components. Charcroft Components bought that company because the owners wanted to retire. And so they took on uh, making the things. And a, a number of things have happened since then. Um, in the old days, they would, they would accept an order for two or three capacitors, a minimum order of 10 pounds. Uh, these days, they talk to me about minimum orders of 100 pounds. 
Uh, now that's quite easy for me because I can, you know, e easily put together that 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 as a requirement. Um, another problem that they have is that uh, they always used to be happy to send anywhere in the world by Royal Mail, and we never lost a shipment. But these days, uh, they're only happy if they send by courier. So costs are more significant. I think within the UK, they'll still do it by mail. So you should be okay. Um, but if you, if, if you run into difficulty, George, just send me an email uh, because okay. I, can, I can order as part of a bigger order and then pass them okay. on to you. Okay. If, you know, if, if it's going to avoid any problems with minimum order size and so on. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, well, that sort of leads me on to my second question, which was, I was, I, uh, I've been on the forum for quite a while, uh, back when it was in Google Groups, um, our Yahoo Groups, sorry, and that's over in uh, groups.io. And uh, I was just wondering if there are any plans uh, in the future to do another run of kits. Uh, I can help you now. The thing is, I mean, I've, I've done runs of kits. Uh, I did one not so long ago. The problem with doing it is it absolutely eats my time. I mean, you wouldn't believe, or maybe you would, I don't know if you've ever done any of these things, but the amount of time it takes um, getting together all of the things that are required and managing the requirements of a bunch of different individuals yeah. um, where they, they all want something subtly different and frequently what they want changes during the cycle and so on. It's massively time consuming. And so as a consequence, I, I just can't do more than one of those every two to three years. Because, you know, it's just, it is huge, the amount of effort. Yeah. So what, what I do uh, when I run a group, I invest in a few more boards and various other things. Um, so that in between times, if people want them, I can just pass them on. Okay. So I still, I do have from the last, uh, the last group buy that I did, which was this year, um, What's that one? Kits, kits for the multi-band unit, and also for the for the single band unit, I have PCBs, um, possibly even some uh, custom cases if people want them. But I mean, they you know, PCBs I have plenty of, which is quite uh, is is the probably the most wanted component. Okay, yeah, uh, I know I had been looking at them. Um, and had been gathering some components, uh, toroids, the wire. Uh, I managed to get a set of boards from a, an Echo Alpha station. Mm -hmm. We uh, had them surplus. Um, wasn't sure about the capacitors, and uh, good to have the opportunity to ask about that. Um, and um, had fancied at some stage the, the full-blown kits for, for the station here. I uh, would also been looking at uh, for the for the club uh, because we in past times when things were different we would have done a lot of operating uh, we have a, a club trailer and we would have taken it out to events and uh, only being able to run one HF station was a bit of a limitation and we'd we'd discussed it a few years back about being able to run two we'd uh, we'd looked at coaxial stub filters. Um, but now the the equipment that the club has, it's it's not, um, it's not like Elecraft or high end, yes, or Icon that would have much tighter bandpass filters in it. It's more standard amateur radio equipment, so proper mm -hmm. filters and stubs might be the requirement, or we might just get away with the filters. What what kind of what kind of radios are they? Oh, it's seven oh sixes and seven four sixes, or seventy four hundreds. Yeah, well, I think both of those have uh, half of them. So, yeah, you'd need you 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 you'd at least need bandpass filters. But uh, you know, if you have anything close by, 
because the so far as the lower bands are concerned, you wouldn't have a problem. 15 and 10 are probably the most significant problem because if it's a half octave filter, as, as I mentioned, 15 and 10 fit the same filter. Um, yeah. You, you'd need to try. But I mean, the, the thing with, with all of these things is you, um, you check to see how much interference you're getting at the 100 watt level before you start sticking amplifiers on and... Uh, uh, we don't have that problem. <laughs> don't have any amplifiers. All right. Well, at 100 or, watts. Or 100 yeah. watts. Yeah. Just bandpass filters are probably, it'll be fine. Okay. That's great. Thank you. And again, I mean, for a thing like that, you know, where you're, you're having uh, people on different bands, as I mentioned, you know, these single band filters, because you don't need to be able to switch from band to band instantly, which yes. is a requirement. If, you, if you're in a contest, you need to be able to move around very, very quickly with minimum fuss. If it's a, an exhibition station or a de-expedition, a few minutes lost in changing a single band bandpass filter to another one is nothing. Yep. And the additional security you get of knowing that only the person with a filter for a band is going to be on a band, it, it's worthwhile doing it that way. Definitely, yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Pleasure. Okay. Anyone else got any dying burning questions there before we uh, uh, we let Bob go? Oh, Eric, Eric's waving the hand here. Go ahead, Eric. Hey, hey, Bob, I wonder, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. It's Eric GI0MSI. I just want to know, do you have a photograph of your uh, aerial array you could choose? Not that I can show you immediately. However, if you can go to qrz.com, yeah. you will see in, and put in 5B4AGN, you will see my main tower. I mean, I've, I've actually got two towers, uh, but you'll see the main tower on there. And that's the main tower has the C31XR on it, but it also has a, a 40 meter two element Moxon. And uh, various other stuff, a six meter Yagi and a 30 meter rotary dipole and so on. You, you, you'll see that on qrz.com if you're looking at my page. What, what sort of height are they up? Uh, when the tower is up, uh, pointing to the Northwest, the uh, C31 XR is about 25 meters high. That's because it's almost, it's not a cliff edge exactly, but we have uh, a step in our ground. There's a big retaining wall and the, my tower is just this side of the retaining wall and there's a big drop. Um, so it, the, it's the height of the tower plus the height of the drop is the, uh, the height above ground in my most favoured direction, which is to the north northwest. Very good, thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands going up there. Bob, I think you're good. So, listen, thank you again so much for uh, joining us this evening. It's been fantastic uh, and great questions too from everyone else. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, Obviously, come back anytime. Come and join us. Uh, we're on the second and fourth Tuesday uh, okay. of each month. Uh, you're more than welcome to come and sit and just enjoy uh, the rest uh, that happen each month. The second Tuesday in November, uh, we have uh, Dave, who's uh, actually with us this evening, G4DPZ, and he's going to be bringing uh, a talk there on AMSAT. And uh, great background there, Dave, too. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, Tim, Tim, Tim Peake showing his flag. Yeah. Tim Peake showing his flag. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, thank you so much as well. To, gentlemen, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. And uh, just one thing, Dave. I must accept the enormous amount of work with great gratitude, Bob, that you put into kitting up this stuff. I just seeing how you packed it 
distributed it. It's absolutely wonderful. Exactly the right number of nuts, bolts, washers, and everything else. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's one of those things. I uh, I'm a bit picky about doing these things. I think if you if you're going to start sending stuff to people, trying you know trying to send them what it is you're supposed to be sending, and sending it in such a way that when it arrives, it's in condition to be used, seems fairly fundamental to me. So I put quite a bit of effort into that. It certainly shows. Thank you. Anyway, it has been my pleasure joining you this evening, and I look forward to joining you again in the future. Anytime at all, Bob. Anytime at all.